My name is Leslie Redmond, and I am the Outreach Manager for the UW Department of OBGYN. And on behalf of the department and the entire team at UW Health, we'd like to welcome you to our talk tonight, which is titled, Bladder Control, a Common and Treatable Concern for Women. Before we begin, I need to cover a few details, and some of this I'm going to be reading because we've got uh, we've got this going as a webinar too, so we've got people online as well as in person, which is great. So um, please be aware, in this case, that the that this session is being recorded. It will be posted to the UW Health website by Friday, and this is for the benefit of people joining us via webinar. Your computer screen should be showing two windows. The box on the left, which says housekeeping, is the viewing window, which shows our speaker slides. To the right is the go to webinar control panel, which is where you control your audio and ask questions. The control panel is set to automatically collapse to the right side of the screen, but you can open and close it by clicking on the orange arrow. If you want to have it open all the time, go to the view menu and uncheck auto hide control. Again, more for people that are online. If you have a question during this presentation, please type it into the question box and press send. Your question will be sent to our facilitator who will hold all questions until the end of our presentation. And for all of you, we've allowed plenty of time at the end to address questions from both our webinar and our and all of you are in person guests. Now we're going to get to it and I'm happy to introduce our speaker. Dr. Christine Heisler is a UW Health OBGYN physician specializing in urogynecology. She attended medical school at the University of North Dakota School of Medicine and Health Sciences in Grand Forks, North Dakota. She completed her residency at Grand Rapids Medical Education Partners in Grand Rapids, Michigan, and her fellowship at Mayo Clinic in Rochester. She has extensive experience caring for women of all ages. She is particularly skilled at managing pelvic floor disorders, including bladder bowel, incontinence, incontinence and organ prolapse. She sees patients at UW Hospital and also right here at the Women's Pelvic Wellness Clinic. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Christine Heisler. So 
the belly button would be up here. This is the belly wall. This is the buttock here. This is the pubic bone. Is everyone seeing this okay when I move the cursor? Okay. This is the clitoris. The urethra is here. The bladder in front of the, uh, the, the, the genital tract. The vagina is here. And then this is the uterus or the womb. And up here we see an ovary and a fallopian tube. The other would be coming out of the, out of the picture at us. Um, down here is the anus, then the rectum, and then this is the uh, sacrum going down to the coccyx or the tailbone, and then these little muscular fibers here is the pelvic floor muscles. So this is what everything looks like in a typical position and its orientation. So we're talking about how urination occurs. I have to tell you that um, finishing residency and medical school and all of that, you have a mindset of how urination happens, but it is a very complex interplay of nerves and muscles. So what I want to do is I created this cartoon, certainly not to scale, um, but <laughs> showing how this works. And it's, it's much more complicated than this, but I think it gives a really nice, simple explanation. So we can see the brain at the top left, the spinal cord is the elongated linear gray line. On the right we have the bladder with the little red dots around it depicting the muscle of the bladder and then the urethra. So the little blue circle on the left of the spinal cord is an area within the, the sacral portion of the spinal cord that houses um, kind of the reflex of urination, if you will. Um, as we're being formed inside of our mothers as, as a fetus, there's a time when our bladder and our nerves are going to talk to one another and this is the house of the house of that reflex arc. So what happens is that the bladder descends. And as the bladder descends and fills with urine, it has to descend down to that little area in the sacrum, telling that area, hey, I've got urine in here. And then the message is sent out from that area back to the bladder to, to empty it. Okay, so this is why babies wear diapers. It's coordinated, but it's involuntary. And anyone who's had a little boy knows, as soon as you take that diaper off, you find out just how uh, involuntary it is. So this is a reflex arc. This is no different than if I tap your knee and your foot just out. You, this is the part where it's like the control part is really hard. So we're going to revisit this again later, but just remember this is the reflex arc of, of urination. So why is it that we can all sit in a room now and we're not wearing diapers? Why, why does that happen? Well, as we get older, we develop the ability to regulate that reflex left arc through a part in our brain stem. So as we gain maturity and our nerves become myelinated or, or they become sheathed, um, and uh, we can understand that when we start first grade, go into second grade, or we're sitting in a lecture, it's the right time to go to the bathroom. We need to defer that urge or defer that, that reflex arc. So what happens? Well, the bladder descends again because we're always making urine, right? And as it descends, the same message is sent back to that spot in our spinal cord. That's always there. But now we've gained some experiences. We've gained, you know, our, our neurological system has matured. So we can then think, oh, I have to go to the bathroom, but it's not the right time. I'm going to wait. So then that message doesn't occur to go back to the bladder it actually goes away, and then we can wait, all right? So this is how we're able to defer that urge and then wait a little bit longer to go to the bathroom. But what happens when it doesn't work so beautifully? And unfortunately, we get a problem either maintaining control of the bladder, meaning we are empty and we don't want to, or we can't store it. So, can I just have you Oh, sure. If anyone has their cell phone on, could you turn the ringer off? That's what's causing that little chirping noise. Sorry. Um, so the International Continent Society changed their definition of your continent to be a very broad, <coughs> wonderfully broad, in fact, definition that urinary incontinence is complaint of any involuntary leakage of urine. And the reason that this is nice is because when we're doing research and we're trying to study these conditions, researcher will, researchers will use a variety of definitions, and then it's hard to compare studies and outcomes because they're using different terms. So this was trying to level the playing fields that we're using similar terminology. Incontinence is a huge problem. It is a socially unacceptable loss of urine. 
and it's a huge health issue for women. Um, how common is it? 25% of high school students and college students will have issues with urinary incontinence. Over half of women in the perimenopausal age will have issues with incontinence. And in fact, over three quarters of women age 75 years or older will have problems with this. This translates to two out of three women having problems with incontinence. As you can see, you can look around this room and see women of a whole variety of ages. Um, you, your friends, family, children, parents, anybody can have this problem. This is not just because we're more mature. It can happen to anybody. So I think that's, again, one of those key um, messages I want to give, which is this is a problem for all of us, for all women. And we need to take it seriously. We need to be advocates for each other. Unfortunately, it does remain hidden. So patients will try to self-manage. When they begin having these symptoms, they will try urinating very frequently. They'll restrict how much fluid they're taking in. They may even start wearing menstrual pads to try to prevent leakage from getting onto their clothing. Nearly two-thirds of patients are symptomatic for two years before they even feel like they're having a problem enough to bring it up to someone. Once they bring it up, 30% um, of those patients don't receive an assessment. And I can actually tell you that from experience, how many times I see a consult where the consult plays for incontinence, and when I go to look at the exam or the history, there is nothing. Most 80% of women aren't even examined. And I think that's particularly challenging as a specialist because there are things that can cause problems with, with bladder control that actually are symptoms of bigger problems. Um, so it's important to have these conditions taken seriously and thoroughly evaluated. So what is the impact of urinary incontinence on the quality of life? Well, there's definitely a physical aspect. So patients who are leaking with activity will frequently say, I don't do those activities anymore. I put on 20 pounds because I can't run or put on the trampoline or go on walk. There's also a psychological aspect. There's a lot of guilt and depression that is associated with urinary incontinence. Also a loss of self-esteem. Patients worry that they're going to be a burden on their families, their spouses, or significant others. Um, they also feel like the unpredictability of their leakage means they do a lot of things that they enjoy, so they're restricting their activities. Also, they're afraid of, of having a urine odor. There's also a social element. So, you know, they're not going out and doing things with their friends or their family as often. They're a little more isolated. Also, um, the entire idea of going out and traveling is almost foreign. They have to think about where's the bathroom, and if I go on a plane, are we going to be able to take off right away? Can I use a toilet, and how long will that take? You know, what if there's a mechanical issue, and we have to wait for an hour or two? Can I do that? Um, there's also domestic issues. Um, there may be a requirement for specialized underwear or bedding, um, as well as taking special precautions with clothing or even traveling with extra clothes and a bag. Um, I've had many patients say, I've got two changes of clothes and a duffel bag in my car. Even just to come to this appointment to see you, I can't trust that I will be able to stay dry. Um, occupational, so for uh, women, as we see, many women are of working age when they're having these troubles. Uh, they might have to take time off work. Especially, they might have a cold where there's a minor cough for some people, but for them, they're going to lose a lot of urine. They can't take that chance at work. Because of that, maybe women are seen as you know, less productive than maybe their partners. Um, they're not able to be seen for the same advances or the same opportunities. And also a sexual component. So some patients, um, they don't want to worry about whether they're going to leak during intercourse with their partner. Um, they maybe start to shy away from some sexual activity and intimacy. So we can see this really spans more than just, I have a little bladder leak. This can really profoundly impact a woman's well-being. The cost of urinary incontinence is also not small. $15.5 billion in 2004. So here we are 12 years later, you can, and this study actually came out in 2014. You can imagine that if we were to recalculate that, this would be even more. So why is this so expensive? Um, well, there are direct costs, so diagnosis, treatment, and then routine care, like women using incontinence pads, which are not cheap. In addition, nursing home admissions, uh, $3 billion in 2004. There's also indirect costs, so if you're not as productive at work and maybe you're on a productivity model, that's going to cause a problem. Also intangible costs, such as pain and suffering and decreased quality of life. So this is a pretty, uh, a pretty problematic area and um, you need to be aware of it. 
So what are the risk factors for incontinence? Well, there are a few things. Um, we know that age, while this is not an old person's problem, it is affecting everybody, but it is more common as we gain maturity. So we do see that um, there is an increase after going through menopause and becoming more mature, that there is more frequently occurring. Um, also rape uh, is more common among women of, um, of European descent. Um, smoking is also a risk factor, and that's for two reasons. One is smoking can lead to coughing, which can cause a lot of pressure within the pelvis, but also the nicotine in cigarette smoke can absolutely <coughs> affect the bladder. Uh, menopause, as we mentioned, kind of going with a little bit of that age element. And obesity is also a risk factor, so the, especially central obesity, women putting weight on through the midsection causes more pressure within the pelvic floor and the pelvic organs. Um, pregnancy and childbirth are risk factors for incontinence. In fact, pregnancy itself, there was a large European study that was done called the Epincon study showing that pregnancy alone is actually a very large risk factor for incontinence. Um, regardless whether you had C-sections or had vaginal deliveries. But childbirth definitely does increase that risk. Strenuous exercise as well as prolapse. Now we really didn't talk about prolapse prior to this moment, but that picture that I showed you where everything's all nice and upside in the pelvis, um, prolapse means things are falling down, they're not supported the same way and that can increase the risk. Conditions associated with incontinence, we've already highlighted some of these things, so childbirth injury, high impact activities, pelvic surgery, pelvic organ prolapse, uh, pelvic radiation. But there's also things like diabetes and stroke, um, then chronic lung disease, chronic cough, constipation even being an issue. So patients will frequently present with constipation and urinary incontinence. Those are two conditions that are very common within uh, uh, taking care of women. Also urinary tract infection, and people don't often think about it, but lumbar disc disease, so people who have disc problems and they get low back pain, you can see uh, kind of the result of that. Fecal impaction as well, in addition to constipation and cognitive impairment. So a lot of conditions can uh, affect continence. So what are some of the barriers to treatment? Well, I would say some of the big ones are that patients have misconceptions, and truthfully, I think a lot of it's fear. Um, they just think, oh, this is just part of normal, everyday, getting older, it's just the way things are for me. Um, you know, or, you know what, it's not really that bad, I just deal with it, you know, it's not a problem. Um, or I could never talk about this with my doctor, it's too embarrassing. Or, you know what, treatment's not going to help anyway. You know, I had a friend and she had a problem and she had treatment and it's going to make it better, I don't want to go through that same thing. So how do we solve these problems? Well, the first thing is to recognize that urinary incontinence is underreported under-recognized and under-treated, that we need to change the perception that incontinence is inevitable and irreversible. Our answer is to have current research that supports the value of non-invasive, conservative treatment strategies, education, and emotional support. So incontinence should not be viewed as a normal part of aging or shameful. It should be viewed as treatable, and that is the main message that we have for the remainder of our discussion. <laughs> there are actually six types of urinary incontinence, and part of the process of treating incontinence is knowing what type of incontinence you have so we're treating the right thing. So patients will wonder, why are you asking me all these questions? It's just incontinence. I'm incontinent. I want help with this. Well, it's important to marry the treatment to the cause. So we're talking about stress urinary incontinence. Has anybody here heard of stress incontinence? Do you guys know what that means? Okay. So patients will say, well, I'm not stressed. Like, my life is great. I don't know what the problem is. But I'm trying to convey, well, this has nothing to do with stress. What we're talking about is it's actually putting increased pressure on the bladder. So coughing, sneezing, laughing, squatting, lifting, anything that increases abdominal pressure squeezes on the bladder. And if the bladder pressure is higher than the urethral pressure or the tube pressure, urine's going to squish out. Okay, so fluids always go from high pressure to low pressure, and that's what we're talking about. So this has nothing to do with emotional distress or life stress. <coughs> now, this is different than urge incontinence. Has anyone heard of urge incontinence or overactive bladder? Is this something maybe you've heard of? Okay. So everyone's seen commercials where that wonderful woman is in the movie theater and her bladder's tugging at her pant leg trying to get her to leave. Um, that's a commercial for medication to treat urge incontinence. So urge incontinence is where that, that urge is, is 
started and you can't overcome that urge. So remember this picture from a little bit ago. So it's the bladder fills. Remember the message gets sent down to the sacrum and the message then should be interpreted like, oh, I'm having this urge to go. And ideally we think, you know, I'm at my daughter's graduation or I'm out to dinner with my significant other. Now is not a good time to go. But what happens with urge incontinence is that ability to override by this brainstem function is thwarted. And then what happens is the message just loops back to the bladder because it never even got that whole message that now is not a good time to go. It stimulates the bladder to go, the bladder contracts, and then urine comes out. So that's urge incontinence. What I tell patients is stress incontinence is an anatomic problem. It's a problem of the urethra not having good pucker support. And urge incontinence is a functional problem. It's a, it's a problem of the way the message is being managed by the body. Okay? So again, urge urinary incontinence, we have the bladder, which is the big circle in the middle. The bladder muscle is like every other muscle in the body. It needs to interpret the nerve message coming down. So all of our muscles and our nerves don't speak the same language. The receptors translate the message from the nerve and tell the muscle what to do. Is the muscle going to contract or is the muscle going to stay relaxed? So these receptors tell that muscle what to do. Sometimes with urge incontinence, that message is received and either the nerve message is too strong or it's discoordinated or the receptors are too sensitive or too numerous. But there's an issue with the way the nerve and the muscle are talking to one another. The other issue is there might be something within the bladder that's causing a problem. This could be a tumor, a stone. It could be something that we're eating or drinking that's getting into our urine that's causing our bladder to be irritated. So when it comes to urge incontinence, you heard me say it's a functional problem. Again, the idea being we're not able to delay the urge to go to the bathroom. There's some component that needs to be further evaluated. Overflow incontinence is a little bit of a, a different issue. Overflow implies that the bladder never really empties well. <coughs> so you always kind of start your, your bladder off with it being half full. Well, if my bucket's empty and your bucket is half full, I can hold more water. So if we're filling at the same rate, you're going to have to empty more frequently than I am. So overflow means you just can't empty out your bladder as well. This could be due to previous surgery. It could be due to, say, for example, diabetes. But there's something going on where the bladder isn't contracting the way it's supposed to. So it could be a squeeze issue or the urethral pucker pressure is way too high. So there's some problem with the bladder emptying. Functional incontinence. This is um, really a matter of you either don't know where bathrooms are, which maybe can happen to any of us, or there's some mobility or functional component where you just can't get to the bathroom in time. As an example, we'll see patients who maybe had a little bit of incontinence that really wasn't bothersome. They were managing okay, and then they had their knee replaced. And now they're going slower and they're rehabilitating. They can't get to the bathroom as quickly, and so that just kind of upsets the aquifer. The last one is really more of a kind of a complicated thing, but it's really about lack of continuity. The urinary tract is a closed system. So kidneys, ureters, bladder, urethra. There is no where for urine to go other than in that tract, okay? But when something happens to disrupt that, then urine can leak out, right? No different than your bathtub bringing a leak, okay? Well, what can happen? Well, there can be a connection or a hole between the bladder the, uh, and the vagina, which the picture on the left is showing that. That's called a vesicovaginal fistula. The bottom middle picture is showing a connection between the kidney tube and the vagina, or ureterovaginal fistula. And then the picture on the right is a beautiful red smear, which to those of you who maybe don't have medical knowledge is what's called a urethral diverticulum. Not uncommon, but that is a little outpouching of the wall of the urethra where urine can collect. And then after you pee, you go to the bathroom, stand up the air, and squishing out because it kind of got caught in this little pocket. Okay? So the point of this is that um, there's just some disruption of the normal closed system of the urinary tract. So the diagnosis um, is such that we obviously need to evaluate a patient who's having this problem. This is why they need, patients need to be seen. 
Um, fortunately, a lot of our preliminary diagnosis is based on finding <coughs> history, uh, an examination, and simple laboratory tests. The first step is you have to talk to your doctor. You are your best advocate, all right? So when you're making use of your healthcare dollars, your copay, the time off work, away from your family, and you're going to go to the doctor, it is absolutely okay to be a little bit of a, um, a little bit of a, a pushy person. It's all right to come in with an agenda, to have questions, to understand what symptoms you want to address. And whether that's your bladder or your heart or anything, you are your best advocate. Importantly, just approach the subject. I want to talk about my bladder. One of my concerns today is my bladder control, or I'm bothered by urinary leakage. Um, open up with a statement addressing the fact that this is an issue. And then what will your doctor want to know? Well, she may characterize the leakage. Well, when did this start? Um, what makes you leak? How much do you leak? And all of those things, remember, we're trying to get at what of the six types of leaking do you have? Maybe there are associated symptoms. Patients might say, you know, I wake up every hour all night long needing to urinate. I wake up with the urge to go, um, and then I can't get to the bathroom. I'm having pain with urination, or I have blood in my urine, and that's new. And then ultimately, it's the degree of bother. Um, why does the degree of bother matter? Well, if the patient may have new symptoms, they're not that bothered from them, but they want to understand what more they can do to try to mitigate some of the future development. So one of the things that we'll frequently do before we even see a patient, and we'll, we'll encourage her to complete what's called a, a bladder diary. Now this is an example from the American Urogynecologic Society. You can get online and download this if you want to do it for yourself. Um, but what a patient is doing is she is recording how much and what type of fluid she's drinking within a 24-hour period. Um, then they have a categorization of the leak um, volume. So They'll say from one to three, so one might be drops, two might be a small squirt, and maybe three is a large bladder volume. The activity during the leak, and this may be none, it may be I was washing dishes or I was coming home from work. Um, was there an urge, yes or no? And then, um, again, we talked about the fluid. So recording this for a 24-hour period can be really valuable when you're presenting these symptoms to your physician, saying, you know, I, I know that my leaking is mainly with an urge, and I know that it's happening, and this is what I'm drinking. Um, you'll be surprised how many times I've seen patients consuming two and three liters of fluid a day and wondering why they have so much urgency and frequency and urgent incontinence. Um, I had a patient in fellowship who was drinking three liters of lemonade a day. So that's a problem. That's not normal. Um, and once she actually went down to a normal volume, her incontinence completely disappeared. So sometimes we can make problems go away just by changing some of the intake. The physical examination, in general, for a, a normal physician, an internist, or a family practice physician, they're going to look at the general appearance, probably do a neurologic exam, because remember the things that were linked to incontinence previously? There are some things that a neurologic exam would be beneficial to rule out. And then a gynecologic examination as well. Um, there may be some routine tests, which we'll talk about in just a second. Um, now, I want to also disclose that doesn't mean you'll get all of these or you'll get all of these before seeing someone else. But be aware that there's a <laughs> to the madness and all of these tests can be beneficial. Um, the first thing, a very, I would assert a, a simple test is the urinalysis. And why do we do that? Well, we're looking to rule out an infection, really. I mean, we want to see if there's a bladder infection present because bladder infections make bladder do nasty things. Um, we also want to see if a patient is retaining urine overflow incontinence, if the patient's not emptying, that might be an indication of what's going on. There's also this thing called a post-void residual. So the name indicates that this is done after urinating. So in other words, a patient will go to the bathroom, spontaneously pee whatever she can. Okay, so she'll urinate normally. And then we're able to assess this post-void residual, or the leftover amount in her bladder, either by draining her bladder with a catheter or by scanning the bladder with an ultrasound. And we do this to make sure the bladder is emptying the way it's supposed to and to assess for overflow. So how many people in this room think it's normal to have urine left over after you pee? Absolutely normal. In fact, up to 25% of your voided volume can be left in your bladder, and that's considered normal. Um, so patients are often surprised when we do their catheterization they see this giant thing of urine sitting next to them. They're wondering, I know I have these. That's kind of crazy. We say it's totally normal, and it is. 
So you always will have some left in. That is normal. Okay. Um, now pad testing. We don't typically do this um, all apart from maybe some studies. Uh, but really what's happening is it's about weighing um, pads, like you collect them for 24 hours and weigh them. And it's just an objective documentation of how much is weight. Now, urodynamic testing is one of the weirdest tests that we do um, because this room is an example of the room where this study takes place. This study is done to assess urinary function. In order to do this test, you are undressed from the waist down. You have at least one other person in the room with you. There's a catheter inside the bladder. There's usually one inside the rectum. We're filling you up slowly over time. Now we have you pee in front of us with your pants off in the room on the chair. <laughs> so you can imagine that this is one where if you have a shy bladder or you're particularly modest, it might be a little challenging. I will say that our nurses who do these procedures are brilliant. They are the most loving people you will ever meet very, very supportive, um, and we work with you on this. So I mean, always disclose it's odd. Um, but why would we need to do this? I mean, really, doesn't it sound like something you do out of the medieval times, like some torture thing? Um, but really, this can lend us very valuable information. So this is an example of what, what we see with this test. Um, and we're measuring the pressures within the bladder and the urethra when we're filling the bladder, and then when you're urinating. It can really be important to rule out a neurologic reason for the leaking, but also to see is there, you know, what's the sensitivity of the bladder and how compliant is your bladder? In other words, does the bladder stay nice and relaxed, you're filling, or does it get really tight and you're fighting against it? And that can also help us to, to determine what's the best therapy for you. Cystoscopy is a procedure where we will pass a small scope through the urethra into the bladder to look for anatomic reasons why there may be some incontinence. So I mentioned this earlier that there could be things that happen within the bladder, like tumors, stones. Um, we want to rule some of that out. If we're doing some basic management and we're just not getting where we need to, this doctor can be helpful just to kind of put that to bed and make sure we're not overlooking something that needs to be dealt with differently. So management. First thing to do, make the appointment, okay? Um, but we have a lot of different ways to help manage this. The first thing, behavioral modification. So there are things that we can do, and again, I'm going to share with you that there is no part of this that's in your head, okay? This is not a decision problem. This is not a constitutional weakness. This is an organic problem. But a lot of these things can change how the bladder will function. So the first thing is fluid intake. So patients will come in saying, I know I'm supposed to drink 64 ounces of water a day, of water, right? Eight, eight ounce glasses, that's what we're supposed to drink a day. And then I have my pot of coffee, and I have a couple of martinis, and I drink, you know, I eat my salads and my soup for lunch, and I've got fruit and vegetables. I mean, patients are consuming a lot more than they're supposed to. And what I will typically tell patients is, if you look at your urine in the toilet and it looks like lemonade or darker, that's normal, you're good, okay? But if your urine's consistently very light and you're going frequently, this may be an issue. So I counsel patients that that number comes from some confusing source that really is not based on normal physiology, that you should drink to thirst unless you're on a lot of meds that drive your thirst. We estimate around 60 ounces of fluid per day total, okay, for a normal average weight woman. Um, and water should be the major component of that. So again, if you're drinking your pot of coffee, that's fine. But try to have a little bit more water with it during the day. And where does all the fluid go? Well, about three quarters of what you ingest is going to be uh, turned into urine. So just think about that. If you're drinking three liters of fluid a day, three quarters of that three liters is turning into pee. Um, about a quarter of it will be lost in your sweat, breath, and in your stool. So again, the major component is going into urine. Weight loss is very important. I know we can't harp on this enough, right? It's, it's the, you know, the, the great mystery of life. Um, but really what we're talking about is trying to maintain a normal weight because of the pressure applied down into the pelvic organs, increasing the, the problems with incontinence. Um, also changing the timing of medication. So it's very common that we'll look at the medication list of patients. We're looking at what types of medicines they're taking. Also mirroring um, their medications with their personal and daily schedule. So a patient may be told um, that she's supposed to take her medicines in the morning but she works third shift. 
And so she gets home at 7 in the morning. She's exhausted. Now she's taking her diuretic, and then she's going to bed, which is normal for her because she works third shift. You can imagine taking a diuretic, which is going to wring you out and dry you out, make a lot of urine, probably not smart right before you go to bed. So we have to look at that. And then also, what about those bothersome symptoms? So not uncommon to have patients, again, taking that diuretic or the water pill. Um, and they might be told to take it in the evening before bed because you know, that's when they're going to get the best benefit of it. Or maybe they're taking it first thing in the morning um, and they're not seeing a big effect from it. So we'll, we'll work with the timing of those medicines with you. And now a word about bladder irritants. So remember that slide where there's little X's inside the bladder? We talked about the things that we eat and drink that can sometimes annoy the bladder. There's only a couple things that cause problems. And so what we're looking at is to make that irritation better and ideally by avoiding all of this, right? <laughs> so here's, here's my plug, and this is why I think um, I do well with patients. I'm very pragmatic. I believe in moderation. So what I tell patients is all of these things have the potential. Okay, so they're a potential thing that can cause a problem. Now, some patients might notice, you are right, when I have coffee, my bladder is really, really irritated and I can tell that it's a problem. Or when I eat strawberries or I have cantaloupe. Most of the time what I tell patients is just look at your normal diet. So if you're eating foods and you're, you kind of notice throughout the day you're kind of eating typical foods and you notice that they cause problems or you have symptoms after eating them, you might want to cut them down or out for a little while. So as an example, I tell patients, so you go home tonight and you're going to have a great spaghetti dinner, right? Tomato sauce, three glasses of red wine, garlic cheese bread, a salad with dressing, and then tomorrow your bladder is really unhappy with you. It could have been anything in that, right? I mean, it could have been the tomatoes, it could have been the wine, um, might have been the dairy product. So sometimes you have to break those things apart and see if there's repetition in your symptoms. Um, I'm not, again, a fan of eliminating everything. You can't exist on white bread and tap water. Like, it's just not a life to live. But we need to be smart about how much we're getting in. Also, we do know that estrogen helps to keep the vaginal tissues and the urinary tract tissues nice and thick and plump. And when estrogen is depleted, as happens as we go through menopause, the, the musculature and the walls thin, and as they do, the lumen widens. It makes it harder to to with activity um, and with urge. So we do talk about the effect of maybe a short course of topical vaginal estrogen as a treatment. And then urge suppression, which um, this is one of the two things I feel a little bit kind of um, <coughs> patronizing when I bring it up, but the, the gist of it is this. Remember when we talked about urge being a reflex arc, right? So the bladder gets suspended, it sends that message to our sacral spinal cord. Right off the bat, the response is that reflex arc to empty the bladder, and we're trying to reduce that. Well, when you get that urge to go, and you feel like you really need to go, and you're going to run to the bathroom because you might leave. When you run to the bathroom, your brain has to think about your legs, the different nervous systems. It, it doesn't want you to fall down, so it's concentrating on your legs and getting you to the bathroom. You're essentially turning your back on that reflex arc. That's like turning your back on a two-year-old in a grocery store. Okay? <laughs> so you just don't do it. If you instead think about the urge, hold the Kegel maneuver and just give it time and don't move, the urge will eventually go away, and when it does, then you can walk to the bathroom. The urge will invariably come back, and you stop. Hold another Kegel contraction, wait for it to pass. When it does, and it will, then walk to the bathroom. Some patients will call me frequently, um, I can't do that all week, and I'll say, I understand. I, I do. I mean, this is not like the magic bullet here. This is like, you know, we're just trying something here. Um, it will render more control especially as women talk about the key and lock syndrome. They're driving home after work, the garage door's going up, they're walking into the house, the key goes in the lock, what happens? I gotta go, I gotta go, and they're trying to run to the bathroom to do that. If you already know that's gonna be an issue, try to sit in the car, let the bladder relax a little bit, slowly get to the door, when it happens, kind of stop, give it a minute. A minute. Um, rushing will ultimately never be helpful, um, so see if that does work. Um, this is my second least favorite thing to talk about, although this can be beneficial. Um, time avoiding is a way for us to urinate without having to have that strong, uncontrollable urge dictating that we have to go. So really what this means is let's say 
um, I get a very strong urge to go every two hours and I can't make it to the bathroom. Really what time voiding is telling me is every hour I'm going to go on the clock. I'm going to go based on the timing that it is, not based on my bladder telling me it's time to go. So for the first week or two, I'm going to go every hour, just based on the clock. And hopefully I'm urinating before I get that urge to go. <laughs> and then maybe a couple weeks after that, I extend that out to every two hours. Again, thinking I'm going before that urge hits. And then a couple weeks after that, you, you extend that time period a little bit longer. What's happening with this is, remember we talked about the brain stem controlling that urge? Well, it might be um, a problem from pregnancy and childbirth and history <coughs> and menopause, but ultimately what's happened is that there's been a change in the way the brain is able to override that urge. So what time voiding is, is it's a way to strengthen that brain bladder con connection. So we're trying to let our brain tell our bladder it's time to go. Again, this isn't a choice problem, but we're going to trick the bladder by us controlling it <laughs> instead of it controlling us. So pelvic muscle exercises can work really well to reduce leaking. So these can be done on your own with one disclaimer for that, is that four out of five of you in this room are going to do your kegels wrong. And it's not because you don't understand them. It's these are really hard muscles to control. So when we're talking about pelvic muscle exercises, I will say you're welcome to do them on your own, but please be coached, whether with your ob or physical therapy, to know that you're doing them correctly before you start doing them. I can't tell you how many times I talk to a patient who says, I've been doing Kegel since my delivery, and I rock at these, and I do my exam, and they're just pushing down really hard, which is not what you want to do when you're Kegeling. You want to squeeze and kind of pull up, okay? Biofeedback can be an important component. This is where we put a pressure-sensitive gauge within the vaginal canal. And then as the woman is squeezing and practicing that Kegel, you can actually look at something that will tell you how strong your contraction is. And so it's just a way to gauge that. You'll learn the technique, and you'll know how hard you're squeezing, but it's nice as you're learning the technique to be able to see that. There are also these devices called vaginal cones. Um, and the vaginal cones are weighted. And their job is to go into the vagina when you're using them to squeeze the muscles and give you a little resistance. It's like an arm curl for your vagina, OK? So um, it can work beautifully to give you that um, kind of sensory awareness of what's there and knowing how to pull up to give you the right technique. There's also electrical stimulation. So this is done as a way to try to recruit those muscles. So it's like a, um, I don't know if anyone's ever had, uh, like if they've had um, like a, a bad knee and you go to physical therapy and it puts those little patches on them and squeezes the muscles and tries to get the muscles to contract. This is doing the same thing. It's not painful, but it's just this little pulse that helps those muscles to contract. There is also a device that you can wear inside of the vagina, which is typically done for prolapse. So we mentioned prolapse earlier, where things are falling down within the vaginal canal. Um, a pessary is a silicone vaginal brace, and it's worn inside the vagina. Incontinence pessaries are the pessary with a little bit of a knob or a thickened area that lives underneath the bladder. So you can see in this picture where that little ball is kind of between the front of the uterus and the base of the bladder. And what it's doing is it's providing resistance. So it's acting like a speed bump. It's narrowing the space that urine has to travel through. So by the, by the compression effect, it's increasing pressure within the lumen. And medication. Um, so medications for bladder issues can be a little expensive, which is why I like this picture a little bit. Um, so what's medication doing, though? Well, ultimately, we've seen this picture now. We know the receptors, again, are translating the nerve message coming from the spinal cord and getting to the bladder. So the receptor that translate the message from the nerve to the bladder can be blocked if they are causing too much contraction or stimulated if they're causing, um, if their job is to cause relaxation, they can make them work harder for us. So really that's what this medication is meant to do, is either block the stimulation or enhance the relaxation of the bladder. So there are multiple types of, or multiple medications within two different families. So I mentioned the medication that blocks the contraction. Those medications are called anticholinergic medications. And the first six fall in that family. So these are 
think of these as the ones that are kind of keeping the bad world out. Their job is to rub your bladder and just keep it nice and calm, okay? The very last one is called mirabegron, and that's the one that its job is to bind to the receptor that's getting the message to relax the bladder. It's like the yoga Zen master of the bladder, and it's reinforcing you know, the message, okay? So the overall effect of, of the medications is to relax the bladder and keep it calm, but it's doing it through two different ways. Well, why are there all these different ways? Well, the anticholinergic or the anti-muscarinic medications are trying to block the muscarinic receptors. So the words are weird, right? I mean, muscarinic think about this. The gist of it is the muscarinic receptor is all over our body. So the very first type of medicine that was invented um, is oxybutynin, and it, it sees all of the different types of the muscarinic receptors in the body, so it sees them in the brain, and in the eyes, in the salivary glands, in the heart, in the stomach, the colon. <laughs> so not only does it do a brilliant job of making your bladder calm, but it calms your colon down. So what do you think happens? You're constipated. It calms your salivary glands down. You don't make saliva. You get dry mouth. Same thing with your lacrimal glands in your eyes. So patients can get dry eyes, dry mouth, constipation, because it works on all of the different receptors in the body. Well, as scientists continue to make newer and newer medications, they were trying to target the receptors that are primarily within the bladder, so that's where you get some of the newer ones. Whereas the uh, mirabegron is um, a medication that's blocking an entirely different receptor altogether. Okay, so, so we started by this global effect, became more specific, and now we said, forget it, let's try a different receptor all together. So that's kind of the genesis of this. So then there's also surgery. Now, again, I trained at Mayo where I tell people, what do you do for a living? I'm a reconstructive pelvic surgeon. Anyone who meets me, I say that. A, it diffuses that whole topic. <laughs> Typically, no one asks me anything more about my job. Um, and when they do, they expect me to say that I replace hips for a living, which is also fine. Um, but I tell them that's what I do. I actually love doing surgery, and I'm the best. I love it, okay? But I'm only going to do surgery when it's really needed. I'm not that kind of surgeon. This is a picture of the Mayo Brothers operating the Mayo Clinic. I love this photograph. Um, and it's important because my children have often said, my mom's the greatest surgeon this side of the Mayo Brothers, so I like to throw that in there as a nod to my beautiful children. <laughs> so we have some surgical options. Now, when we're talking about, so SUI is stress urinary incontinence. Again, coughing, laughing, sneezing, squatting, bending, lifting, leaking. It's a bad uh, urethral pressure problem, right? So these urethra are not well supported. So it's an anatomic problem. What are we doing? We're increasing resistance around the urethra. We're doing something to try to um, help support the urethra. So all of the things that are on here, it's just a lot of words, and I don't want you to get lost for the words, but the point of it is that the newer ways to treat uh, stress incontinence we'll discuss. There are some uh, historical ways that you might have had maybe in the past or know of or your mom or your sister had. Um, but these are all the different types of incontinence procedures for stress incontinence. Now, a mid-urethral sling is the most commonly performed stress incontinence surgery. It is the most widely studied. It has been performed over two million times in this world, okay? And it's been studied to the point where we recognize that its advent has completely revolutionized how we treat stress incontinence. So when you go home and you Google stress incontinence slings and you see the 15,000 lawsuits, it has nothing to do with these slings. That came about because of other things, okay? Um, I actually give a whole nother lecture talking about the legal aspect of the FDA process for slings and for other mesh. And so that's a time for a different lecture, but please be reassured that if this is something you and your physician discuss, this is a valid, well-studied, um, successful approach to treating stress incontinence. The sling material is polypropylene. It looks like fishing line, woven like a chain link fence. Its job is to cup under the urethra so that when you cough, laugh, sneeze, squat, bend, it pushes the urethra into that mesh, into that sling, and it blocks it from leaking, okay? So again, it works very, very well for patients. Now, bulking is another type of treatment for stress incontinence, but specifically reserved for patients whose urethras are poorly supported. They have low, low pressure, but they're kind of stuck open. 
So as an example, a woman who has radiation for cancer, the tissue might get hard and kind of hold the urethra open. Vulcan can work really well. What we do is we inject through that cystoscope that you saw a picture of earlier, a little material under the skin of the urethra where the urethra and the bladder connect. And what it does is it takes the lumen and it makes it shrink down like this. So it provides resistance by adding that bulking. Now there are also procedural or surgical options for urge incontinence. And I'm going to discuss them um, again with the added mention that typically insurance companies do not cover this until you have already exhausted conservative options. So you've tried and failed medications, usually a couple of them. You've had symptoms for a year or more, um, or you've tried physical therapy and, and did not see a reduction in your um, incontinence. So we talk about intravesical, meaning in the bladder, botulinum atoxin injection. This is a Botox injection for your bladder, and it's not because your bladder isn't pretty. Um, <laughs> it's essentially doing the same thing. It's blocking, again, where that receptor is. The nerve message hits the receptor, telling the bladder to contract, and that receptor can't hear the message anymore because it's being blocked by the Botox, okay? So this is done uh, through the cystoscope with tiny little injections all over the inside of the bladder, all over as a way to reduce urge incontinence so the bladder is not getting that hard contraction. The percutaneous tibial nerve stimulation is a therapy that we do in our office where you have a little acupuncture needle that goes onto the inner ankle on one leg, you sit for 20 minutes, and you stimulate that nerve. And why does that work? Well, the truth is we don't completely know. But what we do know is that when you stimulate that nerve, there's a regulation that occurs from the ankle to the bladder. And in fact, recent studies looking at brain MRI, when patients are getting these types of uh, therapies, show that the brain even has different activity during that stimulation. So the way that it's being neuromodulated, again, we don't fully understand, but we do know that it can work for patients who either don't empty or have urge problems. So it's really making that nerve message uh, more regulated. It's done every week for 12 weeks and then maintenance is generally once a month for a 20-minute session. Um, it's not implanted. Um, you go on and live your life the rest of the time, but it is done in the office. Now, interstem therapy is a little bit of a different type of neuromodulation. Interstem is basically implanting that electrode in you so you should take it with you everywhere you go. So you're not going to the office every week, but you do have an implant. It's really no different than a cardiac pacemaker in its size and how it's done. So this is a, a colorful x-ray, if you will, showing the wire that's going through the sacrum, stimulating the bladder nerve. Um, in the center of the screen, those four white dots, so right here in this area. So that's the wire that's stimulating the bladder nerve. And up here, this is the, um, the battery or the programmer. So typically the way that this is done is we um, put the wire in and we stimulate for a period of time to see if you get a good response. If you do, then we implant the programmer. If you don't get a good response, you take the wire out. And it goes right down in the low back, so it's not up where the lumbar spine is, it's down in the buttocks. So I know I have gone over a lot of information, um, but the key points of this lecture that urinary incontinence is not normal. It's not. <coughs> you can't continually normalize it and put it off as something that's just kind of typical. There are a lot of different management options that will be dependent on the type of incontinence, <coughs> on your lifestyle, the degree of bother, if there are any other medical issues going on. Um, so the key thing is to be seen, to be evaluated, and to understand what all the options are. So having Hailed from Michigan, I want to put a nod out to my friend Henry Ford. Whether you think you can or whether you think you can't, you're right. So if you already make up your mind that nothing can happen for it, you're absolutely right. And you will have incontinence, and that is certainly one way to live. Or you can say, you know what, I'm going to do something about it, and I'm going to seek out help, and I'm going to see what more I can do. And we'll be there to help you. Um, so who should you see? You can see your primary care physician. This could be an internist or a family practitioner. You also see your um, obstetrician gynecologist. 
They're also urologists, and then, of course, urogynecolo urogynecologists like me. Um, I am blessed to be part of a beautiful team of people. Uh, we have the Women's Pelvic Wellness Team. Uh, Dr. Giles, Dr. Brown are uro urogynecologists like me. Dr. McCaffrey is a urologist. And then Angie, who is sitting here just a little bit ago, she's our nurse practitioner. Um, if you want to make an appointment with any of us, you can call that number. Uh, we're located at UW Hospital and here at the Duchess of Health. We have cards too. <coughs> Sorry, I'll fast forward. <coughs> All right, so now we're on to the best part of the day. It's questions. Um, I know there's some people that might have responded in on the yeah. webinar part, um, and I apologize. I got a cold developing, so I'm going to take a minute to drink something. Um, but please go ahead and ask me anything that you want. Thank you for sharing your insights. At this time, um, as Dr. Heisler said, we will take questions, and we'll take questions both from you all and from people that are in our webinar audience. Again, webinar audience, thank you for joining us. Type your questions into the question box and press the send button to submit your question to our facilitator. All right, questions. Is decaf coffee also a bladder urine? Yes. It is. Um, so decaf coffee still has some caffeine in it, um, but it can be an irritant as well. Other things like caffeine. Yes. Yeah. But that's a great question. And so I, as I have my coffee, and it's 6:30 at night, <laughs> I typically tell, tell patients again that if you're a big caffeine drinker and you want to see if the caffeine's the problem or if the coffee's the problem, try decaf for a while to make the benefit great. But there's still caffeine in it. It's just it's a lot less. Oh, sorry. Can we have you repeat the question oh, yeah. when someone sure. in person asks so that our webinar audience can hear too? Okay, so the question was whether decaf coffee can still be a bladder irritant. So, and you heard my answer. So I drink kava coffee, which is um, caffeinated but less acid. Would that help? Um, I've been doing it. So I would say if you've switched from typical caffeinated coffee to kava coffee and it's better and you notice less symptoms, I would say that's fine. Sometimes it is an acid issue. You're exactly right. So sometimes it's how much you're taking in that acidifies the urine more so that can irritate the bladder. Might not be caffeine for an individual person, but the acidity of the coffee. So I'm a big believer in trying different things and seeing what is less irritating to the bladder. I have a second question. Yes. What happens? Um, and maybe this is aging, but I used to get up once, um, you know, during the food cycle, and then twice, and now I'm three times. So, I mean, it's <coughs> not an urge. I mean, it's something that wakes me. Um, so the question is, if I understand correctly, the association of increasing need to get up at night and why that's happening and kind of what to do about it maybe. Um, so I think it would depend. The first thing is, I always ask, does your bladder wake you up or does something else wake you up and then you think, well, I'm up, I might as well just go to the bathroom because I think I might need to go. So it's like you wake up with a leg cramp or the neighbor's dog barked or there's a thunderstorm and you kind of woke up with something else. And if that happens, and then you're waking up thinking, well, I'm awake, I might as well go to the bathroom, that's probably not a bladder problem. Um, having said that, though, if you're going to the bathroom and your bladder isn't very full, like you kind of pee for two or three seconds, that's not normal, and that urge should be deferrable. So we didn't really talk about normal bladder volume and how much your bladder should hold. The bladder really should hold about 12 to 15 seconds pretty easily. So that takes anywhere from six to 10 seconds. To urinate out. So if you're just going for one or two seconds, and you're doing that at night often, that could be more of a bladder irritated irritation problem. But if you're going at night and you're going for like eight seconds long at night, you should have gotten up to go to the bathroom. I can't fight normal physiology. Like we're not going to fix that. Um, but the reason you might be making a lot of urine at night can be a fixable problem. You know, it might be you're drinking too much before bed, or you're getting too much fluid built up in your legs in, in the evening, and it's better to like rest and let your legs absorb some of that fluid um, before going to bed. But that's where a lot of those behavioral things come into play and we spend a lot of time talking about that. Um, so I guess to summarize, I would say what's waking you up at night, 
and when you go to the bathroom, are you peeing a little amount or a normal bladder amount? And if you're peeing a little bit of an amount and it's not deferral, that might require some additional investigation or management. Does that help? <laughs> okay. Yeah. Dr. Yes. We have some folks online who are not clear on what Kegel exercises are and they're wondering if there's an online source for demonstrating them. No, that's a great question. So I think so the, the Kegel is a lovingly called like a vaginal muscle contraction, but it's really the pelvic floor. Um, and so, you know, after we have kids, our OB guy tells us, oh, squeeze that muscle, we'll get it back into shape, you know, and, and that's great, but nobody really tells us how to do it. And those muscles are actually um, characterized differently than other muscles in our body. Um, and what I mean by that is those muscles are always turned on. So we don't really think about the fact when we're little kids playing in the playground that we're supposed to squeeze those muscles because they're actually supposed to always be turned on. Um, and so knowing how to recruit them is different than knowing how to move my arm, right? I can think about the fact that I'm using my bicep muscle and I'm, I'm doing arm curl. So a Kegel muscle contraction, women are frequently told, well, it's the muscle that you would use to stop urinating if you were peeing. So if you, if you can stop yourself from peeing, you're doing the right squeeze. And I say don't do that maneuver as bad. But that is technically correct. You're squeezing that muscle. But again, the, the way it's a therapist friend of mine from Michigan describes it as, imagine as you're sitting, you're trying to pull up a cotton ball with your vagina opening. So if you can kind of think about what it would be to pull that up, that's the mindset to have. Um, and if you, I mean, I don't know how comfortable everyone is, but there's nothing wrong with putting your own finger in your vaginal opening and doing that maneuver and seeing do you feel the muscles constricting around your finger. And if you do, you're doing them correctly. And if you don't feel that, you're not. And then I would just encourage you the next time you see your physician to say, especially if you're coming in to see your OB guy and they're doing an exam anyway, could you coach me on this? You know, could you just tell me what you're doing? Um, I'm not aware of any online resources because again, like people can describe it, but I think unless you have somebody coach me, you can tell if you're doing it right. If you feel your vaginal muscle squeezing around your finger, but if you're not, it takes somebody helping you to be able to know how to do it. So I'm a big fan of learning the maneuver before kind of prophesizing global utilization of it. <laughs> I think it's better to, you know, at least know you're doing it right. Like I wouldn't start running without a coach telling me how to do it right. If I'm going to be in a marathon, I want to know that I've maximized my training to be as efficient and strong as possible. I could get hurt otherwise. Well, the hurt that we're talking about maybe doesn't injure us, but it can really affect us at first. How many and how often should someone do? I love this question. So there's no really great magic number, but what I tell patients is that the correct technique, again, those muscles are always turned on. So in other words, you squeezing and, 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 and 10 times does not help them. Those muscles need to have a contraction that's held. Specifically, you hold it as long as you can for 15 to 30 seconds, and it's hard. That's hard to do. Um, and do it, um, I would say typically do it in the, like, if I say stoplight, waiting in line at the grocery store. If you get your triggers, you'll do it every day. The important thing is that you exercise a muscle every day. What happens if you don't exercise a muscle every day? You lose the strength. So the muscle that the muscle strength you gain today isn't good tomorrow. It's only good for the day you're doing it, right? So you have to do it every day. And I would just keep practicing them. If you do five to 10 like that, where you're holding it for 15 to 30 seconds, you should see a benefit of it. Now, some physical therapists will require their patients to do it more frequently while they're building the muscle. Um, but I say as long as you build up those triggers, so in a grocery store line, at a stoplight or a stop sign, um, you know, you're sitting in church or you're sitting out at a movie or something, just learn your triggers and practice them every single day. Yes? I believe that I was told that doing Kegel and Kegel, which is like the pronunciation? Um, they're both fine. Okay. Yeah. Um, that you, you'll never gain more control than you have today or just preventing your incontinence from worsening. No, that's actually not true. So there are a lot of studies now with physical therapists looking at, so I'll, I'll give you this other added benefit. So not only does physical therapy help your pelvic floor, but our, a lot of patients aren't aware that their pelvic floor is one third of their core muscle tone. So it's not even just your pelvic floor. You have to strengthen your abdominal wall and your back muscles. Um, with if <laughs> 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 you do Pilates and, and learn the proper technique of putting their ribs in their front pocket and just standing in the correct posture will inherently feel their pelvic floor muscles contracting. 
Now, having said that, I'll also say if I do an exam on a patient and she has no muscular anything, like everything's been denervated because of birth trauma, um, those are harder patients to rehabilitate, but it's still not impossible. There are other ways to work with them. Um, but I, I'm not a big fan of kind of Betty Gloom and Doom before you even try. It's kind of like, well, if the best I'm going to get is me stabilizing now, why the hell go? Like, that's just dumb. But the, at the kind of mentality is I'm going to go and learn new tools, and anything you touch, you can't, you can't unlearn it, right? I mean, you can't unring a bell. So the minute you've done it, you've learned something. And just inherently learning it and knowing what you're trying to treat, I think, can make a big difference. Um, so, I mean, I think of it being, again, working with a coach. You know, I'm never going to run a Boston Marathon, ever, for a lot of reasons. Um, but does that mean I shouldn't at least learn the technique of how to be a proper runner and how to do the correct, you know, method? I mean, I think there's benefit to that. And in fact, I know there is, and now studies are coming out showing that. Yes, um, red shirt first. Oh, sorry, you guys both did at the same time, so. <laughs> you had said that stress and time was in that category. Yes. So is there a relationship then between some of the bladder irritants, or is that more, does that kind of just play more for coach? That is, so that's a great question. The question is, stress incontinence is deemed an anatomic prob problem, so are there things that happen within the bladder as urges that can worsen that? So there is a condition called mixed incontinence, which is the marriage of urge and stress. And what I frequently tell patients is that um, it's very common to have both, urge and stress incontinence. And when you're managing urge incontinence, so urge, remember, is heightened pressure. The bladder's contracting. So if the bladder's already tight and <laughs> you cough, it doesn't take as much of a cough to get urine to squish out because you're going from already a higher system and a low urethral pressure to an even higher pressure system. But if you treat the urge problem, patients will see an improvement in their stress incontinence. So one of my typical mantras is treating urge can make stress better. Treating stress actually can make urge worse. So by increasing urethral resistance, the bladder has to push even harder to get urine out, so you're kind of inherently training it to work harder. So it's not that the urge and stress are, um, the bladder irritants are making stress worse. The bladder irritants can make the urge worse, which makes leaking easier with activity. Does that make sense? Yes. Okay. All right. I'm sorry. Go ahead. My question relates almost to running, but as an older woman, I've now noticed that when I go out for a very brisk walk, if I walk later in the day, I get a lot of urinary leakage. And I'm assuming that's because I'm drinking more water during the day rather than the night. And when I, so I've changed my walking time or my exercise <coughs> in the morning just to reduce the nuisance of it. But could you help me understand the physiology there? And am I correct in assuming it's simply that I've been drinking water during the day? Or? Um, so the question is, uh, in a woman whose exercise program used to be walking later in the day, or any time running. of the day, and I never um, had urinary leakage. Yeah. Yeah. So running. So I never so exercising any time during the day and having increasing issues. When you change it to first thing in the morning, you notice less issues of stress incontinence, and that absolutely makes physiologic sense. While you're sleeping at night, under most circumstances, we're not consuming any fluid. You are as dehydrated as you will ever be all day long first thing in the morning when you wake up. Unless you were up all night partying and drinking. Yeah. <laughs> um, but assuming you're sleeping, as we all should be doing at night, then in the morning you're as dehydrated as you will be. So you're making less urine inherently. So as you're eating and drinking and going through your day, you're adding now back into the system more of that fluid, which is going to become urine. But first thing in the morning, especially if you don't drink before you go on your walk, that's as dry as you're going to get, typically. And will Kegel, will improving my Kegels help the walking later in the day, or is, it, is this something that I just have to accept? So the question being if Kegels will help to reduce leaking during the day, I want to yes. at, at the end of the day. Yes, that should help. So again, by, by strengthening, the, strengthening the abdominal wall in the, and the back and the pelvic floor all together, and then inherently knowing how to contract that, that will translate into improved continence when you're Any questions from online? Oh, I'll assume that meant I answered all the questions. There's a question here. Yes. Yeah. Sorry, I'm in place, but I had trouble with the, with the rain and we stopped finding this. But uh, anyway, um, I'm not sure if you've posted something like a test bar or a test yeah. three. The question is that, is that taking me? Yeah. Is that an idea for an older person? I, I know of somebody who Where, like, she said that probably 
the usual pollution for older women, and she had only one child, but it was kind of a traumatic experience. She was really, really strong that she had some. That, along with the Yes, so actually you're hitting on some great questions that we that we covered, and I think telling your friend about the online portion, which will be available for your review. Um, so she's asking questions about some of the topics that we've addressed in terms of additional measures to treat incontinence. One of them, whether an incontinence test is still an option, it absolutely is. Um, there are actually 26 different kinds of pessaries with about 10 different sizes of each. So there are many options. Um, so whether it's uh, a patient doing well from a, a standard pessary or specifically using an incontinence pessary, they're absolutely still used. It can be a great benefit, especially in patients who are having more laxity or falling down in the vaginal walls. Um, in addition to hormone replacement therapy, so I don't typically call it hormone replacement therapy. You just call it hormone therapy. Um, and I don't advocate for oral, but I advocate for topical or vaginal estrogen therapy or hormone therapy. So it can be beneficial because I want the effect to be in the tissues that have the actual receptors for estrogen, which are in the vagina. Um, and then, again, it depends on does the patient have a uterus, does she have a history of breast cancer. So we review some of those things. And if the patient doesn't have any other um, complicating factors, she's had a never had breast cancer, we very much uh, advocate for using estrogen therapy in the vagina. Yeah, it can be a great way to thicken the tissues up and improve. So there is a slight risk still, even with patches of the or, or that is somewhat carcinogenic. There is a risk of that. Um, well, when you're talking about anything that, that delivers estrogen <coughs> systemically, so whether it's a patch or a pill, again, depends on the age of the patient, how long they've been on it, were they postmenopausal and then restarted something, or have they always been on something, um, what are their other risk factors. So, I mean, that really goes outside of the scope of the discussion. Um, but from my specialty standpoint, we will typically discuss using a vaginal preparation of estrogen because it delivers the medicine exactly where I want it to be, which is in the vaginal tissues adjacent to the urinary tract. And it is a, one of the first line therapies that we'll use. So it could even reverse that condition. It, yeah, it could definitely improve things. I'm afraid to travel. Yep. Yep. So I think that um, for for, so for the concern that your friend has, I think that you're beautifully wrapping up a lot of the things that we talked about in terms of, um, you know, this is a real big problem for women. There are a lot of different options for help, but the first step is you have to see somebody to get that help. So she has to get out to be seen. Um, I brought my, my and my partner's cards. You're welcome to take the cards with you, give them to her. If she has a computer, you could log on to the site and show her this. Um, so, I mean, and, and she can look at the slides. So. <laughs> Do you need a referral from your primary physician to come here? No. Um, so patients can self-refer to come and see us. Um, we will typically <laughs> want to... <laughs> okay. Sorry. <laughs> I use it all through my old practice, 
And when I moved here, I came to find out that it's actually not available. I am currently working with the Department of Biomedical Engineering to make another one um, because I love using it. And it was a great way to help with women who have isolated times of leaking. So like when they run or if they're doing kickboxing classes or, or something that's predictable. Um, so I think the Impreza was developed as a means to say we need something over the counter, something patients can just try. I do think there's benefit for stress incontinence. Um, you have to just try it to find out if it's going to work. You um, have to actually buy this <coughs> three size packet to find out which, which one, one you fits. Need. Yeah, and it's, I mean, it works great, but, you know, the other option is, um, you know, if you want to be seen first, because, again, that's great for stress incontinence, but you want to make sure you're ruling out other things that could be going on. So I would say that most women are going to see a mixed incontinence picture where they have issues with urge and with activity, or very commonly women will say, well, I only leak with a cough. When my bladder is really full and I'm going to the bath, like I'm trying to walk to the bathroom, then I'm leaking. And to me, that's a very muddy, mixed incontinence picture. Um, so it's not, or they have a hard cough after they've deferred the urge three times, and then they have a hard cough or a sneeze, <coughs> and they self-diagnose they have stress incontinence, and really that's not their primary problem. So <coughs> there is some some um, clarification for for diagnosing the right condition and knowing that the impressible. will. Um, any questions? Sure. Um, can bladder issues and leak apnea have anything to do with each other? Absolutely. Yes. So can you repeat the question? So the question is whether the incontinence and sleep apnea have a correlative or are, are connected to one another, and they are. So one issue is that when patients don't sleep well at night, so um, for whatever means, you have, you know, you, you've got your grandkids over and they're waking up constantly or the neighbors are having their parties or something, you're not sleeping well, that leads to some <laughs> agitation, so the nerves are kind of irritated. If you don't sleep well, your brain can't reset, your nerves can't reset, and that can cause problems. The issue with sleep apnea, so sleep apnea is also a very big problem. Sleep apnea is where you're sleeping at night, you're going on about your business sleeping, and what happens is that you don't you can't exchange oxygen, you can't bring oxygen in, and, it, and then you don't breathe, and then your CO2 goes up, and all of a sudden you get the and then you wake up, and so patients wake up groggy in the morning, they're waking up 10, 15, 20 times at night, constantly with this like choking feeling, or just constantly waking up, and so that causes problems from the standpoint of not sleeping at night. Um, sleep apnea causes a lot more issues, it increases your risk of cardiac death, increases a whole other host of problems for patients. So if that resonates with you, that, hey, I think I might have that, please, please, please go get checked. You're not at risk tonight necessarily, but just in the long-term health, it's a huge thing. But it's really the sleep cycle being disturbed that causes problems. My husband had apnea, and I'm the one that discovered Yeah. He had no idea. He was getting headaches. Headaches in the morning, but, waking up tired. Yeah. But if you have somebody who's sleeping with or watches sleep, yep. they can actually see you stop breathing. You're right. That's exactly right. So it's often partners that will tell their significant other, I think you have a breathing problem. You need to go get that checked out. Um, and if you like your partner, you might want them to get that treated. And if you don't, maybe you let it go. But, um, <laughs> but yeah, you usually get it treated. Yes. Um, I, have, I had endometriosis for about 40 years. And I left with brown death. And the inability to absorb a lot of complex carbohydrates. And I have the food prep diet. But it doesn't, I can't follow it regularly. Okay. So you get a whole lot of gas built up. And when you have gas built up and your blood is sort of full, all of a sudden. So, is there anything that you can do about, you can't follow the food map rigorously because you leave out a lot of health issues. So, here's a comment. Um, so the question is pertaining to um, 
certain diets that can cause gastrointestinal issues that when you pass gas or when you're moving around, then urine can come out. And there's, there's part of that problem actually has to do with the way the nerves talk to the rectum. So when patients have things like endometriosis or pelvic surgery or other things that affect the pelvic nerve, yeah. what ends up happening is that the rectum has the same nerve supply that the bladder does. And in patients who maybe have IBS or they have gluten intolerance or other things that make diarrhea and make food come too quickly, the nerves that are telling the rectum something are telling the same thing to the bladder. And so if something's irritating to the rectum, it, that nerve message can get overshot to <coughs> the bladder. Um, physical therapy can work really well for that. So there are ways to learn how to help with some of the control with physical therapy. Um, sometimes it's an allergen or an inflammation problem, and then that needs to be evaluated by an allergist. Um, but it sounds like what you're describing might be a little more complex than what we're talking about. Well, okay, I had this condition for 45 years before it was diagnosed. They used my knees, and things got a lot better, except that. Before I give you anything, and now I have to do this. So, diet plus the referral for physical therapist. So, the question again being in conditions that existed before, now we're seeing a change in them, you know, two plus decades later. Also, remember that as we mature and our tissues change with that process, there may be things that you were doing differently 20 years ago in terms of compensating that you're unable to do now, whether it's due to the chronicity of the symptoms, thinning of the tissues, um, change in weight, and other things. So I would definitely say that physical therapy, um, meeting with a nutritionist or a dietitian could be beneficial, um, might require a visit to an allergen or uh, an allergist um, to be able to assess whether there's another component. But again, I would say that you're going to have to, I mean, we can talk privately after the oh, lecture, but fine. I would say that you're kind of, again, maybe a little higher level, more organ involvement than just urinary incontinence. But it definitely, I mean, I think anybody who's, um, who's got one organ system involved typically has more than that. So, I mean, we, that's where I love what I do because we don't just have to deal with bladder. We have to deal with the entire pelvis. Yes? The last time the vaginal loss, is that a part of leakage? Um, so the question being whether the uh, collapse of the vaginal walls is part of the leakage, and it can be. So if the bladder is sinking down a little bit and then the bladder to the urethra, that angle changes, um, that can lead to some leaking problems for patients. And in fact, sometimes what happens is if the bladder drops really low, it can kink off the urethra, making it hard to empty. So that when you um, are moving and doing other things, the bladder staying kind of full, making it more likely that you'll leak when you have that stress or the movement. So prolapse or the vaginal wall falling down can certainly complicate things. Yes, so physical therapy can actually help strengthen the connection and the pelvic floor support. Um, and you can also use an incontinence pessary or even just a regular pessary can be helpful. Yes. Yep. So if the bulge is happening where it's opening up the vaginal um, um, uh, introitus or the opening of the vagina wide, um, a pessary can bring the tissue back up to let those muscles rehabilitate better. Whereas when that tissue is falling down and it's pushing the uh, vaginal opening wider, like it feels like a baby's head's coming through or there's an egg or something there, um, it's harder to get those muscles to strengthen around it because it's kind of constantly dilating the opening. But if you wear a pessary and lift that up, those muscles now can constrict a little bit better and strengthen. Exactly. So a pessary doesn't prevent you from doing the kegels. In a lot of ways, it can make it easier to do them because it's pulling that pressure up. Well, we're just about out of time, so thank you, everybody. I have a couple of announcements before we all go. First, I'd like to remind everyone this webinar has been recorded, and so um, by Friday it should be posted. You can go to uwhealth.org slash OBGYN. By typing that in the browser, you'll be able to find our webinar. And um, consider sharing it with your friends or people that you know that might be interested in it. On the screen now, Welcome to the list of programs that are coming up. Um, you all might be interested in uh, a free event we're having on November 9th about pelvic floor disorders. 
um, kind of uh, on the same vein, but it, it'll be a really nice event, I think. So check check it out on the whealthorg.org website this month for details. And last, um, I know some of you have already done it, but please fill out the evaluation forms for us. It's really important for us to know how you, how you felt about today. <laughs> Thank you.